We're back with part two of lecture number four. We were discussing American innovators and stopped with Thomas Edison at the end of our last lecture. While Edison is remembered for his many technical inventions, Henry Ford is remembered for a new labor system he invented. Let's dispel another myth that many people have about American inventors during this period. Henry Ford does not invent the automobile there were already cars around. His genius lie, however, in speeding up the production of automobiles. Henry Ford is the innovator of the assembly line process in which you break down the construction, in this case of an automobile, you break it down into its component parts and you have workers that are standing in front of a continuously moving conveyor belt that are sending them the parts that they need to attach that wheel, right? And then they attach that wheel and the car keeps moving down, the assembly line keeps moving down and then someone else is responsible for attaching a bumper or another part to the car. In doing so, Ford was able to dramatically reduce the amount of time it took for his company to crank out his famous Model T's. Prior to developing the assembly line process, it took the Ford Motor Company 14 hours to produce one automobile. After the assembly line process was instituted, that dropped to one automobile every one and a half hours, or every 93 minutes. Mass production also enabled Ford to drop the price of his product from $845 to less than $300. This will allow even the working class to begin joining the wealthy on the roads. By 1918, in fact, half of all cars in the United States were Ford Model Ts. For your average American, all of this technological change in such a short period of time was something of a mixed blessing. We're going to see that now people can hear the voice of their loved ones on the other end of a telephone. They can hop in an automobile and get to their destination much faster than ever before. We will also see real wages rising during the late 19th century and consumer prices staying relatively stable. So let's take a moment to understand this phenomena. The assembly line process that Henry Ford innovates to create automobiles and to drop the price of the product, his automobiles, so more people can buy them, won't stay confined to the car making industry. You will now have other producers of other consumer goods, toasters, umbrellas, you name it, beginning to incorporate this assembly line process in the production of their items. What this means is that prices for many products will either remain stable over time or they actually will drop over time, allowing more Americans to afford what had once before been considered a luxury item. So what do I mean by real wages rising? Real wages is the amount that you have left over at the end of the month after you have paid for your rent, you paid for your food, you paid for your necessities, it, it is the amount of discretionary income that you have at the end of the month. Why do people have more discretionary income at the end of the month during this period? It's not because their bosses are giving them raises. Let's be clear about that. They're not making more money. They're spending less money. With the price of everything from bread to automobiles to other consumer goods dropping, now it takes a smaller percentage of their paycheck to take care of their bills every month. So we see that increasingly many Americans, because the price of goods keeps falling, this is they end up having more money at the end of the month. Let's be clear, however. This does not mean that Americans were rolling in cash. What it means is you're starting to see, especially among the middle class in the United States, that they are beginning to have more money to spend on luxury items. And we're going to talk more about that as we move forward in our lecture material coming up. Let's also talk about this phrase, the Gilded Age. To gild something means to cover it in a thin layer of gold leaf so that if you didn't know something wasn't solid gold then you might it, it would appear to be solid gold 
So for example, look at the gold ballroom at Marble House, one of the many vacation homes that the very wealthy Vanderbilt family constructed during this age. This ballroom is not made out of solid gold. It is gilded. There's a lot of carved woodworking, you can see in the walls here, that are simply covered with a fine layer of gold leaf. So why do I bring up what gilding means? Why do, why do we call this era the Gilded Age? Because for some of the most wealthy industrialists of the age, they will be making fantastically high profits during the period. Their lives will be charmed. They will be able to afford to go on multi-country vacations. They will be able to construct these you know, huge mansions and staff them with legions of servants, drivers and butlers and cooks and what have you. For the top 1%, as we like to use that phrase today, their lives were beautiful, glittering, you know, they looked solid gold. However, for many working class Americans, their lives were nowhere near this opulent or nice. Their lives were oftentimes shorter, too, given the terrible working conditions in many factories across the United States. To come back to the analogy of gilding something, all it takes to figure out that something is not solid gold is to simply scratch the surface. Once you get beyond that thin, beautiful layer of gold leaf, you start to get down and see that things might not be as they appear. So this is why many historians characterize the late 19th century as the Gilded Age, also taking its name from a Mark Twain novel entitled that, uh, that for the few that were privileged, the Rockefellers, the Vanderbilts, the Astors, their lives were beautiful. Meanwhile, many Americans' lives were not. Few Americans were enjoying the American dream, in other words, during the late 19th century. In fact, for many, their lives more closely resembled a nightmare. To begin, there were the horrific working conditions that many men, women, and children endured. Child labor was commonplace during the late 19th century. There were no laws preventing children as young as six, seven, eight years of age from working in coal mines, for example. Let's take a moment to understand why employers would hire a child versus an adult to do the same job. Their small stature. Children can get into smaller spaces that adults simply cannot fit in. To come back to coal mining, for example, if you're trying to open up a new seam and it's a very narrow space, you might call for little Timmy to get in there and start chipping away 12 hours a day in you know, the darkness to try and open up uh, ultimately a mine shaft. Children had smaller hands. You can see the picture here on the slide of a textile uh, uh, mill. And you can see the children working at the machines. If there's some kind of a, a snarl of yarn underneath the machines and they stop working, then you send in the smallest worker that you've got with their small hands to come in and unclog that machine. If the machine restarts while the child is still underneath it and the child is maimed or killed, that's just what happened during that time period. There were no lawsuits. There were, was no conception of workers' compensation. If you were injured on the job during this period, then you were told to just go home, I guess, and regrow an arm and, and come back to work the, uh, later. If you are injured on the job, you don't receive sick pay. You don't receive any sort of compensation for your injuries. You're, you're, you're just simply out of work and not earning any money for the time it takes you to recuperate. Let's look at another reason why managers prefer child laborers in some instances. They're small and they're easy to intimidate, meaning that you can treat a child laborer in ways that if you tried to treat an adult laborer the same way, you would end up with a fistfight. Take a look, for example, at the photograph I have here on the slide of the Ewan Breaker at a uh, Pennsylvania coal uh, company installation in 1911. Look at the children breaking up the pieces of coal and look at their manager, an adult manager standing behind them, and he's carrying in his hand an iron bar. He's not carrying that for looks, folks. He's carrying that so that if one of these child workers, you know, maybe is not going fast enough or gets sleepy and can't is not doing their job, he can wrap them upside the head with that. 
it was not uncommon, in other words, for managers in during this time period to physically correct child laborers. And the parents really were helpless. They couldn't, you know, do anything about that or risk losing uh, the income from their child's job to the family income. And speaking of money, let's look at yet another reason why managers prefer child laborers, in some cases, over adult laborers. They can pay them a fraction of what they would pay an adult laborer. The idea being that this child is, you know, one-fifth of an adult human, so I'm going to pay them one-fifth of what I'd pay an adult laborer. At this point, you might be thinking, who in the world would let their child work on a fishing boat in a coal mine in these dangerous, dangerous jobs? No parent would willingly do that. But for many working class Americans and immigrant families, they needed income from multiple sources just to put food on the table. In other words, if their jobs were so low paying that uh, they couldn't pay all their bills, then the children might be taken out of school and instead put to work. Immigrant families especially were seeing hard times during this period. They came over with literally nothing and they have got to put food on the table and this in many cases involves uh, their children being forced to earn a wage. You can see the primary source that I have here on the slide of a woman who went out and interviewed a number of Italian immigrants in New York City in 1908 and they're looking at a particular family in which the main wage earner is a 13 year old girl by the name of Rosina. Uh, their family members had fallen ill of tuberculosis and many of, of her siblings were still yet too young to work and earn a wage. so. You can imagine the, the crushing weight of responsibility that falls on this poor girl's shoulders to put food on the table and to take care of her family members. All laborers, whether they were children or adults, faced incredibly unhealthy working conditions in certain industries. Coal miners, in particular, suffered from the extremes of heat and cold poor ventilation, mine shafts that were prone to collapse with no notice, trapping workers underground in permanent tombs. Of those that survived, many went on to develop respiratory diseases from breathing in coal dust over the years, eventually dying prematurely from disorders like black lung disease. You can see the photographs here on the slide of a healthy lung. Uh, the healthy lung of a 90-year-old school teacher looks great. Right next to it, a 40-year-old miner who died of progressive lung disease. You can see how shriveled and blackened that lung tissue is. The concept of an eight-hour workday was also unheard of during the Gilded Age. There were no such things as retirement benefits or pension plans. As for management, most bosses seemed oblivious or worse to the dangers that their workers faced, pulling 12, 14, 16-hour days with no overtime. It's not surprising that discontent began to grow among the working class. So too did public sympathy for their plight. This was thanks in part to the work of journalists and ed editorialists during the period who became known as muckrakers. A muckraker was a journalist who tried to explo expose the plight of the working poor and how in some cases big businesses had been allowed to grow without any oversight. Ida Tarbell is a good example of one of these journalists or muckrakers who were investigating these social ills during the period. Tarbell wrote an expose of the largest oil refining company of the day, Standard Oil Corporation, headed by John D. Rockefeller. She undertook some serious research into the Rockefeller Corporation, Standard Oil Company, and over time she found out that they were able to achieve a monopoly by illegally chasing out many of their competitors in the same business. She said that what really ruined their greatness for her was the fact that they, quote, didn't play fair, unquote and they were able to reap handsome profits by not playing fair. By 1890, Standard Oil Company controlled over 90% of the oil refining business in the United States. We'll talk more about Tarbell's work and the rise of huge monopolies in the United States in part three of this lecture.